As you approach the metal grill, you can hear several voices having what appears to be an animated discussion. This must be it. Beyond this door lies the beaten heart of radical communism in Martinez. Somehow, the night air softens the smell of trash and sea brine. As the breeze pulls through the canvas like a shuttle through a loom, you catch a hint of something unexpected. Something earthy, warm, and burnt. The acrid smell of failure. No, that's just slightly burnt coffee. A smell you would recognize anywhere. Just look at these pigs sniffing about after hours. Must have slipped my mind. You know how it goes. The metal grill is cool to the touch. You notice the lieutenant is looking uncustomarily anxious. His posture is rigid. His right hand hovers near the zipper of his jacket. He wants so badly to draw his armistice, but he also doesn't want to want to draw it. Oh, I'm fine. I was practically born to infiltrate underground communist cells. Which is just to say, we should be prepared for any eventuality. He can make out at least two separate voices. Two voices, both male. Approximately early 20s. Careful with those now. I have it. It's going to work. I can feel it. The clang of metal reverberates all along the scaffolding. The voices coming from the other side fall silent. Who's there? Is that you, Maurice? Who said communist? Did we say communist? Get out of here. For a moment, silence. What's the passphrase? There's no response. You begin to wonder whether they've slipped out some back way. All right. The key's taped to the back of the doorframe. Just make sure you put it back when you're done, or we'll all be locked out. And do wash the concrete. It just kind of falls away, in places. Charmant, after you, detective. Have fun at your underground meeting, pig. Hope it's a blast. The two young men are either oblivious to or ignoring your entrance. Their attentions are fixed on whatever it is they're stacking in the middle of the floor. Matchboxes, it appears. I think it's holding, Ulexis. It is. It's holding. It's definitely not holding. Those matchboxes are stacked so haphazardly, it's like they want them to collapse. Careful, careful. Damn, hardly any difference. You two, you are late. They should know the meeting starts at 10 p.m. sharp. There's a great deal of tension in this young man's shoulders, more than someone his age should bear. Meanwhile, his companion inclines toward him, eager to catch every word that dribbles from his friend's mouth. Just a moment. Could this be the former owner of a certain jacket you acquired recently? Don't let them see you, flustered sire. Play along. Hey, Stepan. Isn't that your jacket? What a coincidence. You two have the same jacket. What are the odds? It certainly looks like my jacket, Ulexus. Where did you get that, your darn? Yeah, I'm sure you did. That's real Sarah Maritzian to it. Only old Sarah Maritzian communists and drug smugglers wear those anymore. He is neither of those, of course. He is simply a poor student putting on ears. Also, 
He doesn't have the shoulders to fill out such a jacket. See, Uli? It's just like Mother Road. How does it go again? Those committed to the rights of property are those most apt to violate them. Just a minute. Steban. Ulitsis. Why do those names ring the faintest of bells? You should get to the bottom of this. I assumed there was Maurice who broke into my room to play a trick on me. I didn't think I'd actually been raided by the RCM. There is surprise in his voice, naturally. But is that a note of excitement you also detect? Absolutely not. You have to keep it. Can you imagine the look on Morris's face when he finds out the RCM has been kicking my door down? He has shit himself. Positively. And now they've shown up in force to break up our meeting. <sighs> Something tells me this young man is not very experienced with law enforcement. The RCM wants to join us? My partner, of course, is acting in a strictly personal capacity, not as an official representative of the RCM. Interesting. Does that mean you've done the reading? No, Detective. The only reading I've been doing is right here. I have not had time to seek out pretentious communist book clubs, nor have I done their reading. It doesn't sound like they've done the reading, Stabon. Well, this is getting awkward. I'm not sure what you're expecting to find here, then. There's profound consternation in his voice. You suspect it's about something bigger than you're not having done the reading. Maybe they can explain themselves. In the most generous sense, I would say we're cultivating revolutionary consciousness. Yes, that's probably the best way to describe it. But more specifically, we are running a reading group. The most rigorous and theoretically advanced materialist reading group in Martinez. Comrade Steban is a great discussion leader. One of the best at the university. That's our whole thing. The world is so shallow, all noise and repetition. We're interested in genuinely radical critique. Precisely. We are not interested in senseless parroting. We like to read critically. Within the contours of Mazovian historical materialism, of course. Huh. As though you can call that problem teaching. One thing you learn quickly at university is that you're not going to find a real education in any lecture hall or discussion seminar. We are post-attendance, basically. Exactly. The only worthwhile part of the so-called École Normale de Revachol is the library. That's where we've made our greatest critical strides. We study all the foundational texts of Mazovian theory, of course. Just last week, we finished the second volume of Puncher and Watman's Innocence of Capital. It's truly extraordinary. And before that, we spent six weeks on state and plasm. For some reason, the word plasm catches in your ear like a piece of old wax. Uh-oh. You can feel your attention span rapidly deteriorating. We've also read Wert Müller's The Mega Structure of History, and before that, real and reality. Communist theorists love puns, in case that wasn't obvious. Ablars in pain fernal. The original Fisdale translation, not that worded down revisionist garbage. These two deserve the order of honor for bullshitting. There's no way they've actually read all this stuff. Obviously. <laughs> but, of course. Our special emphasis is on the theories of Ignaz Nilsson and his followers, especially the inframaterialists. You're not familiar with him? It's pretty advanced stuff. You may not be ready for it yet, Gendarme. Only Krasmazov's most trusted lieutenant, the evangelist of the revolution, and the founding father of the People's Republic of Samara. It's hard to overstate how unimpressed he is that you've never heard of this world historical individual. He also happens to be the greatest communist theorist after Mazov himself. It was Nielsen who first postulated the existence of ideological plasma, which forms the basis of inframaterialist theory. Those words again. 
You've got to find out what this inframaterialist stuff is all about. Whatever it is, one thing's perfectly clear. These young students have a much deeper understanding of communism than you do. You could learn a thing or two from them. If you can convince them, you're one of them. The young man sighs. His companion looks about furtively. Lynching? No. We're not an operational cell. We think of ourselves as more of an intellectual vanguard. To be clear, communism is not an official suspect in this investigation, because it's not a person, you see. Seems unlikely, from a strictly inframaterialist perspective. Comrade Ulix is his right. The amount of plasm required to strike down an ideological enemy outright is enormous. We're talking second level effects, at a minimum. Or even third. What are these levels they're talking about? This doesn't sound like any communism you've encountered before. In any case, it's not like the SRV has established a party line on the subject of lynchings in Martinez. Though historically speaking, the SRV has supported direct action against right-wing paramilitary squads, especially when they are doing the Indotribes dirty work. Good point. So as a provisional matter, I can say we support it. Are they being sarcastic? You feel like you're caught in some elaborate joke labyrinth, but it's impossible to see your way through. It's always that way. Beneath the crust of irony, there's a molten sincerity that threatens to erupt forth. You may witness it yet. No, we're an independent organization. We acknowledge and respect the Union's efforts, but our interests are more theoretical than Mr. Clare's. He speaks the truth. That's easy. Crime is simply the inevitable expression of the injustice and incoherence embedded within capitalism itself. Delivered with the smug assurance of a schoolboy reciting a maxim he's committed to memory. It's a symptom, in other words, not a cause. His companion can barely suppress a yawn. No, unfortunately. The communards were hunted down and killed nearly to a man. All that's left of them are bones and old rifles. His companion's eyes widen as you hold up the ancient weapon. He's practically itching to stick that thing in someone's face and pull the trigger. Yes, like that one. I wonder how many of these are still lying around in cellars or sealed up behind the masonry. Can I hold it? It's heavier than I was expecting. Though what, exactly, you can't say. He turns the rifle over again, admiring the glint of light off the oily barrel. When he's finished, he returns the rifle to you with a nod of appreciation. What do you mean? This is the reading group. We're in something of a rebuilding phase. Some of our former comrades didn't have the ideological fortitude our work demands. Intellectual attrition is maybe the best way to describe it. Felix said he couldn't keep up with the reading on top of his classwork. And Zuzano wanted to read text other than Mazovian theory. Like novels, if you can believe it. Imagine the audacity of wanting to read a novel in a reading group. See? Even the gendarme gets it. We've tried recruiting new members, but unfortunately the current intellectual climate is pretty hostile to inframaterialist thought. These days, if you're on the left, the ascendant schools are the Godwalians and their iconoclards. Don't forget about Maurice and the turnips. <sighs> right. Then there is the whole turnip debacle. They're the most depressing school of communism. They love writing long books with a patina of Mazovian theory to cover up their cheap psychologizing. A gang of cheap psychologists and intellectual midgets. <laughs> Typical Godwalders, in other words. It's okay for Uli to say that because his dad is from Godwald. The Godwald school believe that intellectuals as a class are capable of sparking revolutionary change. So all they can do is critique capitalism from inside itself. That's why they spend all their time smoking cigarettes and writing long works of criticism that make you want to commit suicide. 
If it were, they wouldn't keep committing suicide. You see, the Gotwal school look like communists. They talk like communists. But scratch the patina and you'll see beneath that they're just depressed liberals who've read too many books. For starters, they love talking about beans. That's right. Iconoclards are obsessed with beans. They love thinking about beans. They love counting beans. But most of all, they love building models to predict how many beans there will be in the future. Nota bene, Iconoclard is an extra pejorative form of the already pejorative name, Mazovian Economists, a moderate school of Mazovianism which advocates the gradual transition to communism through carefully managed economic modernization rather than violent social revolution. They're by far the most bean-centric school of communism. Ah yes, the much maligned bean counters, ensconced in their think tanks and high-rises, believing they can save the world through a series of incremental, assiduously technocratic reforms. If only. They've got all the beans accounted for in their asset sheets, their quarterly budgets, their future projections. But for some reason, there are never enough beans to go around. So we've just got to cut our bean rations in half. And next thing you know, there are budget cuts. So now we've got to cut the bean rations in half again. You see, iconoclards claim to be communists. But in reality, they're just liberals with hard-ons for spreadsheets. Of course not. The only people who actually call themselves liberals are mouth-foaming reactionaries. Basically indistinguishable from fascists. You'd need an X-ray machine to tell the difference. Cindy is... How to describe her role? Something of an ideological auxiliary, perhaps. Yes. That's exactly how I would put it. And naturally, we support her radical counter-liberal aesthetics. But she refuses to submit an essay, so... We can't call her a member of the group per se. That doesn't stop her from using a room for studio space, of course. Ah, <sighs> it's an unfortunate story. You see, our ex-comrade Maurice is something of an economist. He's studying macro and microeconomics. Well, a real intellectual, it sounds like. Right. So a few weeks ago, we were discussing the extra physical capabilities of the revolutionary state. And Maurice said, what were his exact words, Ulexis? It was unbelievable. He said, Turnips don't care if they are grown by communists, moralists, or Vulcan. They grow just the same. Basically, he was rejecting the whole foundation of inframaterialist theory. Simply that under suitably revolutionary conditions, crop yields naturally increase relative to non-revolutionary crops which Morris somehow has the gall to deny. Susanna said that he has been hanging out with some non-communists lately. For us, the question boiled down to, if you don't even accept the basic ideas of Nielsen and inframaterialist theory, why are you in the rating group? Exactly. What educated person could believe that turnips grow at the same rate under capitalism and communism? It's a sad reflection on our educational institutions. Well, it wasn't so much that he was expelled. He just quit coming. We haven't seen him around for weeks. Go ahead. The young man frowns at the little pile of boxes on the floor. Nothing, just messing around until the meeting started. They're watching those matchboxes awfully intently for two guys who are just messing around. It's almost as though they were trying to create the most unstable structure they could. You've read our article. That I did not expect. The energy in the room has shifted ever so slightly in your favor. They're afraid they've somehow embarrassed themselves in front of you. Well, don't keep us on tenterhooks. What did you think of the essay? The delicate egos on these boys. Even though you're just some cop, they're desperate for your approval. Hey, you're not just some cop. You've got highly developed critical faculties. Now's your chance to show them off. 
Well, of course, that's just an initial foray into the subject. We're hoping to return to it for a more substantial treatment next term. In any case, I'm glad our piece found its audience. That's always the hope with these things, you know. We typically only accept new members once per semester. There's this whole process with essays and presentations on assigned topics. But given that we have some extra seating at the moment, I guess we could be convinced to expedite an application or two. Stepan, you can't be serious. For these gendarmes? I am serious. As materialists, we've got to adapt to conditions as they are. Besides, you still need to pass the interview portion of the entrance process. Assuming he's even still interested, that is. What's there to be scared of? You've really been cracking the books these last few days. You can go toe to intellectual toe with any reading group in Martinez. You've spent a not inconsiderable amount of time arranging the works in your mental library by theme and period. All the ideas and references you'll need are ready at hand. Now, chin up. You've got this. Oh, you want to start now? Sure, we can manage that. You've caught him off balance. The momentum is already in your favor. Go ahead and take a seat. Since we haven't had time to prepare an exhaustive questionnaire, I think we can keep this interview more freeform. Why don't you tell us a bit about the books you're interested in? And we'll just see where the conversation goes. We prefer difficult books. Books that might destroy you if you don't destroy them first. That's enough, Uli. It's the gendarmes' opinions we are interested in. But to comrade Ulix's point, isn't there value in reading really difficult books just for the sheer challenge of it? Oh, right. Sixteen days of coldest whatever. This is a good start. They're starting to loosen up. You feel relaxed and in control. You ably summarize the novel's characters and themes. Even better, you're able to connect those themes to your critique of the novel's formal qualities, such as they are. It's no wonder you couldn't finish it. Sounds like turgid bourgeois social realism. And Gradian realism is the worst realism. It's nearly as bad as Gottwaldian critical theory. Makes you want to gouge your eyes out. Or better gouge the author's eyes out. These kids are eating out of your hand, practically. Another quarter of an hour disappears. The questions come rapid fire, but you have an answer for every one. Now you can sense things starting to slow down. The interview must be reaching an inflection point. But now I'm curious. Do you think there's value in reading so-called practical nonfiction? Hmm. So you're saying you've got to have a certain practical foundation before you move on to more abstract topics? Now's your chance to end this interview on a high note. Soon, you're subjecting even the alphabet to a meticulous archaeologico-materialist critique. That's true. I recall from one of psycholinguistics lectures that the letter A is derived from the proto paracanassian glyph meant to represent a reed hut. A fair point. It also reminds me of one of Mazov and Nielsen's unrealized projects, a universal system of communist pictographs, one that would allow revolutionaries to communicate and organize across any language barrier. Good God, have we really been talking about the alphabet for a quarter hour? It appears so. In any case, I think we've heard enough. We could use someone with your perspective in the group, with just a bit more theoretical foundation. I think you'll be making real contributions. Yes, I would say he's got serious potential at least. And with that, welcome to the most ideologically advanced materialist reading room in Martinez. Here's your first assignment. It's an overview of inframaterialist theory. A little basic, as you'll see, but one has to start somewhere. You're going to fit right in, I think. Come back when you're done. We'll be here pretty much every night after 10 p.m. Do be sure to take your time with the reading. We'll be eager to hear your thoughts.
The cover of this pocket-sized volume features a swirl of orange, yellow, and green. The title, A Brief Look at Inframaterialism, is set in an authoritative yet approachable serif font. What an interesting color palette. It's vibrant, yet somehow leaves you ever so slightly nauseated. On the inside jacket flap, you find a brief summary. What is inframaterialism? A highly theoretical branch of Mazovian communism? A collection of mystical ramblings by a discredited revolutionary? Or possibly both? This brief look, TM, introduces readers to one of this century's most fascinating and misunderstood theories in a concise, jargon-free manner. You turn to the table of contents. The guide itself is divided into several sections with seemingly esoteric titles like Effects of Plasm on Root Vegetables and Mental Projection and Transference. There's also a brief introduction about the life of Ingus Nielsen. Known to his numerous admirers as the Evangelist of the Revolution and to his even more numerous enemies as the Apocalyptic Shrike, Ingus Nielsen remains one of the most controversial and fascinating figures to emerge in the years of the anti-centennial revolution, second only to Krasmazov himself. During his unparalleled life, he helped guide a revolution in one country and found a new state in another. Along the way, he committed some of the most notorious war crimes in an era famed for its atrocities. And yet, his most fascinating contribution to history may be the most overlooked. His theory of ideological plasm from which his followers and successors developed the school of communism known as inframaterialism. If you're like most people, you probably believe that your thoughts reside in your brain, right? Completely backwards. You think with your hands. Always have. This sounds more like a question for a psychiatrist. See also a brief look at psychiatry. But let's stick with Ingus Nielsen a moment. As Mazel's devoted comrade and leading theoretician, Nielsen was responsible for developing much of the intellectual foundation of communism. But his interests and speculations were famously wide-ranging. During his final years in exile, he produced, among other things, an early guide to home brewing, instructions for raising revolutionary children, plans for a universal pictographic language, and a detailed materialist critique of Dolores Day's chess strategy. A true man of ideas, equal to any of the great DeLorean polymaths. But one subject he returned to time and time again was the fundamental relationship between thoughts and matter. We may yet discover, he wrote in his notebooks, that under certain exceptional circumstances, the proletariat's embrace of historical materialism may be so fervent that their beliefs take form in the world of matter as a kind of revolutionary plasm. Certainly, in essence, Nielsen is arguing that thoughts don't just reside inside the brain, they radiate outward from it. According to this idea, the brain is an ideological transponder, constantly emitting waves of highly politicized energy, which Nielsen called plasm. Woe is right. What's more, Nielsen speculated that this plasm, when it becomes powerful enough, might begin to influence the material reality surrounding it. Hence the name, inframaterialism. Unfortunately, Nielsen passed away before he was able to develop these initial ideas into a full-fledged theory. That work was left to subsequent generations of communist theorists. Building on Nielsen's basic insight, these theorists reached a startling conclusion that a sufficiently revolutionary state might begin to exhibit certain extra-physical effects based on the amount of plasm generated by its citizens. Correct, though certain particulars of the theory are commonly attributed to Nielsen himself, the evidentiary basis of those attributions has always been a point of contention between inframaterialists and their critics. 
The actual theory is highly technical, but for the purposes of this brief look, TM, that's a fine working definition of the concept. Inframaterialists divide the extra-physical effects of the revolutionary state by the level of plasm required to achieve them. At the lowest, or first level, revolutionary plasm is believed to stimulate or invigorate matter without altering its essential properties. Precisely, though plasm does more than increase vegetable yields, it may also influence the physiology of revolutionaries themselves. It's also been postulated that plasm may account for the remarkably full and manly facial hair observed on many communist males. Of course, inframaterialists argue that revolutionary plasm may stimulate human physiology in other ways as well. In fact, reports from the revolutionary period claim that the most radically devoted communards were able to engage in vigorous intercourse for up to eight hours at a time. Eight hours? There's no way. Your equipment would be mashed to jelly. No wonder the communards couldn't shoot straight. They were too shagged out. Hyperproductive vegetables and ultra-horny communards are fine, but this theory hasn't quite gotten strange enough for you. And on that note, you feel like you've gotten the general idea of inframaterialism, enough to carry on a basic conversation at least. But if you'd like to go even deeper into some of the more speculative aspects of the theory, you could always read further. Of course you want to go deeper. What else are you here for? The book fits quite snugly into your palm. It would also fit comfortably into a jacket pocket. You flip forward a few pages until you come upon a chapter titled Mental Projection and Transference. When a community has achieved a sufficiently high degree of revolutionary fervor, inframaterialists believe that second level effects may be observed. At this second level, certain hyper-revolutionary individuals may even develop the ability to extend their thoughts into material space and vice versa. According to inframaterialist theory, yes, under suitably revolutionary conditions, that is. It's become something of a folk legend that during their final meeting, Nielsen and Mazov didn't speak a single word, preferring to sit in silence with their chamomile tea, reading one another's thoughts. One of the minor tragedies of the late revolutionary period is that few reliable accounts survive. Much of what we know of the communards activities during this period come from memoirs and second-hand accounts, some only written down decades after the fact, and of dubious authenticity. Because plasm has never been directly observed, the exact mechanism behind these effects remains entirely speculative. Most inframaterialists would argue that the inability of skeptics to detect plasm is simply evidence of their own insufficient revolutionary enthusiasm. This should be more than enough for a stimulating discussion. That said, if you're still yearning for more, you breeze through the next several sections until you arrive at the final chapter, titled, A Communism Above Reality. When a society's revolutionary fervor reaches the third and highest level, inframaterialist theoreticians have postulated that the laws of physics cease to be laws. More like suggestions, according to some of the SRV's leading inframaterialists. Of course, it's impossible to say what exactly happens under these conditions. No known society has ever achieved the levels of revolutionary enthusiasm the theory seems to require. Some inframaterialists have even argued that it might require more plasm than humanity alone may be capable of producing. In the SRV, there have been attempts to organize certain species of aquatic mammals as well as a few of the higher corvids. But as of this writing, 
Only human beings have demonstrated the intellectual capacity for revolutionary communism. There are numerous stories from Samara involving bandits or fascist mercenaries being levitated by farmers from the most ideologically advanced communes. Of course, few of these incidents have ever been rigorously investigated or substantiated. The form of these stories also recalls several well-known Samaran folk tales, in particular the one commonly known as Clever Oleg and the Flying Magistrate. Among known attempts to channel third-level capabilities, the most well-documented is the curious case of Coalition Warship Debutante. It concerns an interesting series of events that took place during the invasion of Revachol. As Coalition forces made landfall, a cadre of Nielsen's most fervent acolytes attempted to compress a Coalition aerostatic with their collective will. According to Communard law, these acolytes positioned themselves at the top of a redoubt just over the Bay of Revachol. From that vantage, they proceeded to visualize pinching Coalition warship debutante between their fingers, a gesture believed to assist in the extra-physical materialization of their thoughts. There's no evidence the communards were equipped with finger pistols, though it's unlikely they would have decisively altered the outcome. The acolytes, along with the redoubt, were vaporized in an artillery strike before the process could be completed. It's been said, though, that in the weeks following the battle, the captain of the debutante noted an increase in the incidence of crewmen striking their heads on unexpectedly low bulkheads. Of course, colorful anecdotes only scratch the surface of what inframaterialists believe may be possible in a truly third-level society. Some have theorized that such a society would be fundamentally unrecognizable, lacking many of the institutions we typically take for granted in advanced societies, including organized governments, financial institutions, and law enforcement. Duh, did that book just say there's no place for you in this future? Others have argued that people living under third-level conditions will be immune to such infirmities as hunger, disease, and mental illness. In some of his later writings, Nielsen himself speculated about the potential for an extra-physical architecture that disregards the laws of bourgeois physics and, instead, relies on the revolutionary faith of the people for structural integrity. Precisely, Nielsen observed that the financial system operates on the same principle of faith. So why not an architectural system? On the following page, you come across a few black and white reproductions from Nielsen's own notebooks. One sketch depicts a government ministry shaped like a great inverted pyramid, a hectare in width at the top, balanced atop foundations the size of common apartments. Another depicts a leaning tower wrapped in a dramatic helix. The caption beneath it reads, The Tower of History. Something about that tower looks awfully familiar. Could it be that's what the students were trying to recreate with the matchboxes? In the corner of one of the reproduced notebook pages, you can make out the following words written in Nielsen's distinctive slashing script. A state that has lost the faith of its people has forfeited the right to exist. There is no more. You've reached the outer theoretical limits of communism and in less than 200 pages. If you'd like to read further, may we recommend a brief look at Occidental Architecture 